Um, happy to have you here. These two cars are from the Detroit Historical Society. My name is Dave. I'm the automotive and industrial curator for Detroit Historical. So I'm in charge of the cars and telling the story of the Industrial Revolution in Detroit, which is a task that's insurmountable, as you might imagine. But to the car at hand, it's our 1963 Cougar II show car. To be clear, it's a Ford Cougar II. So when they started producing the show car, they bounced around a lot of different names. This one was named the Cougar seven years before Mercury decided to name their car. So they decided they wanted a show car that ran and drove. So they called Shelby in California. Now everybody seen the Ford, Fer Ford versus Ferrari movie? This is 1962, so this is real early in the game for Shelby. This car is chassis 2008, so it is the eighth Shelby Cobra ever produced. Uh, this one left the factory as a 260 four-speed automatic, or, <laughs> 260 four-speed disc brake car. They said that the Dearborn steel tubing, which was the show car contractor for Ford, stripped the bodywork off of it and built this car on top of it, which means at some point in DST, there was an entire aluminum body for a Shelby Cobra sitting in a dumpster. Time tells us a lot of things. So this car is actually built with fiberglass. It's a quick way to prototype. They built this in 63. It was shown all throughout the United States in 1963. Sent back to Ford. We think they reshot it because there's a, a, a tape line in the jam where they repainted it once. Then in 64, it went to the World's Fair where they debuted the Mustang. So if you watch the film of the Mustang debut in 1964, this car is in the background. Then it went into kind of relative obscurity. It went to a warehouse in, in 1985 for donated the tariff to, to us. So the car next to it was actually built after this one. Uh, that car they decided, Eugene Bordenay, who was the designer of both cars, decided he wanted a car that would be like a show car that he could drive. So they ordered a second Shelby. Uh, Shelby. This one is 3001. So it's second generation of Shelby's car, but the first car produced. So it has a 289 automatic and the first car had coilovers. So in the Shelby Lydia, both cars are, are reasonably, uh, they're, they're in the Shelby registry, you can look them up. Uh, but it, it, and I won't, my daughter's an engineer, I, you know, so I won't bang on engineers, but in the typical engineer design, so they designed these cars, they wanted them running and driving, right? That was the whole thing for my shoulder. When design got a hold of they linked the foot boxes in the, in the fender well so low that you couldn't get the head of the head on the engine. So both cars have essentially a long block in them, so the nose stays low, but they, they don't move under their own power. Question? We good so far? So the second one, this one's fiberglass, like I said, this one is actually, the second one is actually built out of a material called Royal Tex which Ford never marketed, other than in the ads for this car. So what I would think is it was probably something they were going to use for a part. So what better way to showcase a new vacuum forming technology you have than to build a car on it? Um, like you said, they're, they're sister cars. You can tell they're kind of the same design path. For my money, I think the Fastback has a cleaner line to it. I mean, as much as we all love convertibles, and who doesn't love convertible? Um, for me, the, I, I love the deck and I love the style of that car, but when you put them next to each other, it's really hard not to lean heavy on the and of course, the color of the fastback doesn't hurt its prominence either. Questions? Is that top not removable? It's funny, it's got, that it literally has no top. It's got four holes where a top would have been, and I've never seen a picture of that car with a top on. What about the Cougar 2? That doesn't have a removable? No, this one's fixed. That's a fastback. Yeah. So this one, toured, like I said, they, they made a model kit of this car. I mean, it, it toured everywhere. You can find a ton of pictures of it. The other one, the only pictures that seem to pop up on it are when they have it in the uh, styling studio. So they're either studio shots in the light room or they pulled it outside and it's by the, if you've ever been to the Dearborn, the proving ground in Dearborn, it's got the 12 foot red brick wall. All the outside pictures of that car are by the red brick wall. So it was really more of an in-house car. It didn't get out and get the provenance that this one did. But it's when, again, when you look at the, shelf, the scope of Shelby, uh, those wire wheels are original to the car. The tires are original. It's got the original Shelby brake pads in it. So as we were moving things around and getting ready to go, as you're holding these items in history, like, how many NOS, uh, you know, 1963 Goodyear Blue Street tires could be left to put on an original Shelby? Yeah, it's both amazing and terrifying sometimes at the same time. Yeah. But we're fortunate to be the custodians of these cars. Um, we have a, depending on how you determine car, we have about 90 in our collection. Our brick and mortar is actually right across the street, Detroit Historical. Uh, right now in the automotive showcase, we have our, we have our 1975 Pacer. Wait, pauses for laughter. It's VIN number one. It's the first Pacer ever produced, and it was Dick Teague's car, the guy that styled those Pacers. But both are unrestored survivors. Uh, like I said, if you come back around when the sun comes over the building, this car and the sunlight is amazing. It's a really, really pretty color. I talked to, uh, I had the car out for a show, and Gene Winfield came over, and he was looking at it, and he goes, uh, 
I can't remember if I painted this one or if Jeffrey's painted it. So he walked around it a little more. He's like, no, I think Jeff painted this one. I don't remember. <laughs> I go, what was the process on something like that? He goes, well, what we do is we put down about 20 coats of the color, because this is nitrocellulose, a paint they don't make anymore. He goes, we put down about 20 coats, let it cure overnight, come back, sand it, put down another 20 coats, and then put it outside and look at it in the sun and see what it looked like. And then we'd either rub it or continue until we get Jeez. Yeah. So there's probably, especially since this one's been repainted, so there's probably 40 coats of nitrocellulose, 40, 60 coats of nitrocellulose on this car. But it rubs well, that's what makes it look deep. The trade-off is nitrocellulose doesn't have any UV protection. So if you see an old show car that sat outside for any amount of time, the paint literally falls off the sheets. The reason this car looks like it does is because it's lived in warehouses its whole life. 